I think we've all heard at least one person say, it's just a cartoon, or animated movies are for kids. But many of the animated films we grew up loving are more than just cartoons. There are lots of ways that people grow morally wired during our developmental years. Obvious influences include school, parents, siblings, friendships, and religion. It's possible then to overlook the significant role played by stories. Those told to us during our mental development and the moral messages embedded within those shows and movies are proven to affect our lifelong worldviews. Psychologists generally agree that watching films and TV has a significant impact on our mental development during childhood. Sally Goddard Blythe, director of the Institute for Neurophysiological Psychology in Chester, England, observes that when you don't give children these stereotypes of good and bad, you don't give them a moral code at which to develop their own lives. The importance of providing children with examples of admirable morality through simplified content is evident. The Toy Story movies taught us about the power of friendship. Winnie the Pooh taught us the value of individuality. The Lion King taught us the importance of self-belief and overcoming grief. But one animated movie's message hits me harder than any other. Brad Bird's 1999 animated classic, The Iron Giant, tells the story of a young boy who discovers and befriends a giant robot from outer space. After the robot is discovered by a paranoid FBI agent, the boy attempts to prevent the US military from finding and destroying it. It pretty much shares identical story beats with 1982's E.T. The Extraterrestrial. Boy finds creature, boy befriends creature, creature is threatened by government, creature leaves, and boy gets upset. But what makes the Iron Giant more than an animated E.T. knockoff is its ability to tackle deep and complex themes like war, mortality, self-sacrifice, and racial and cultural xenophobia. So without further ado, let's explore the brilliance of Brad Bird's The Iron Giant. Welcome to downtown Coolsville. Population? Set in small-town America on the coast of Maine during the height of the Cold War, the movie puts spins on the overused genre tropes of the era, from alien invasions to nuclear holocaust, which reflected the paranoia of the time. The story begins the same way so many other movies set in the 50s do, with a foreign object crashing to Earth from outer space, this time a giant metal robot, linked in the opening shot with the looming specter of Sputnik, an omnipresent reminder of the Soviet Union's space race advantage. The giant is discovered in the woods by a young boy named Hogarth, who takes the sentient but simple-minded being under his wing teaching him how to talk and stay hidden, correctly reasoning that his appearance would cause a panic or worse. Sweet mother of God. But the Iron Giant goes far beyond the war is bad, guns are evil fable and tackles something far more complex. Brad Bird's film recognizes that first impressions can be dangerously simple and limit our understanding of the world around us. The small community of Rockwell is wholly convinced that the rumored Iron Giant is an astronomical threat, but in reality, the creature's maneuvering the world with the apprehension of a lost child. Hogarth, barely into his adolescence, becomes far more introspective than the rest of the town once he recognizes the Iron Giant's innocence, and he instills the Iron Giant with the idea that he is what he chooses to be, rather than succumbing to the expectations set by others. To reinforce these themes, Brad Bird uses one of the most rudimentary storytelling devices to deliver the film's moral component, character arcs. In his book, Save the Cat, Blake Snyder defines character arcs as the change that occurs to any character from the beginning through the middle into the end of each character's journey. Character arcs are one of the most obvious methods used by filmmakers to embed a moral message within a story. Characters are our gateway into a film's story. The story is told from their perspective, through their eyes, and we can become quickly attached to them. We're taken on their journey, we experience the same things, we meet the same people, and if done correctly, we learn the same lessons. In The Iron Giant, there are two important character arcs that we can learn from directly. Hogarth's and the Giants. To analyze both of these arcs, I'll be using K.M. Wayland's book, Creating Character Arcs, for reference. In her book, Wayland outlines five types of character arcs, the positive change arc, the flat arc, the fall arc, the disillusionment arc, and the corruption arc. The two that are relevant to this video are the positive change arc and the flat arc. We'll be covering the three negative change arcs in future videos, so be sure to subscribe if you want to see those. The most obvious character arc in the film belongs to the giant. He starts the movie as a weapon of mass destruction, and the damage to his head opens up an opportunity for him to learn a new way of life and embrace his own morals. This is what K.M. Wayland describes as a positive change arc. This is the most popular and often the most resonant character arc. The protagonist will start out with varying levels of personal unfulfillment and denial. Over the course of the story, they'll be forced to challenge their initial beliefs about themselves and the world until finally they conquer their inner demons and end their arc having changed in a positive way. This type of arc reinforces the idea that being a good person is the right way to live, and that even bad people can become good people. Beyond that, the giant shares a much more personal connection to director Brad Bird. Bird's sister was a victim of gun violence. 
In 1989, Susan Bird was murdered by her estranged husband at just 36 years old. This loss of a close family member sparked a strong resentment towards guns. And while mourning his sister, a thought crossed Brad Bird's mind. What if a gun didn't want to be a gun? What if the gun that took his sister's life had a soul and didn't want to do what it was designed to do? This is where he conceived the idea to adapt the Iron Giant's children's story into an anti-gun film. But even though the most obvious character arc belongs to the giant, I think the more thematically important character arc actually belongs to the protagonist, Hogarth. The significance of Hogarth's character arc may not be obvious at first, because his development falls under what Wayland describes as a flat arc. At first you may think that a flat arc sounds like an insult about a character that fails to develop, but that can be farther from the truth. It takes a great writer to write a flat arc that's as impactful on a narrative as a positive change arc. In a flat arc, the character is the same at the end of the story as they were at the beginning. Some great examples include Gandalf in Lord of the Rings, Marty McFly in Back to the Future, and Howard in Uncut Gems. All of these characters play vital roles in their respective films without having to go through any significant development, but they do eminently affect the characters around them. Hogarth in The Iron Giant is another great example. Wayland's flat arc can be deconstructed into 10 points which coincide with the story beats of traditional three-act structure. Point 1 character believes truth in a lie-ridden world. The protagonist believes a truth that the rest of the normal world rejects. The normal world and most of its characters are tainted by a central lie which inhibits them in some way. In the case of the Iron Giant, the citizens of Rockwell manifest the widespread xenophobia shared by Americans during the peak of the Cold War. Anything that is foreign and unfamiliar is instantly seen as a threat. But Hogarth is different, and this is shown in the diner scene at the beginning of the story. Hogarth is introduced as adventurous, curious, and caring. Using his love of animals as a source of affection that his exasperated single working mother has trouble providing herself. Hogarth, unlike the rest of his town, is unafraid of the unfamiliar. Point 2. Challenge to use the truth to oppose the lie. This is the call to adventure or the inciting incident, the part of the story where the protagonist first encounters the main conflict that presents a direct challenge to their truth. The question at this point is whether or not they can be convinced to take action in wielding the truth against the lie of the world around them. This is the part where Hogarth first encounters the Iron Giant. Even though he feels initial fear, his morals still compel him to save them. Hogarth then experiences the giant's innocence and befriends him, despite knowing the people of Rockwell will have a negative and violent response to a massive sentient robot. Point 3. World tries to forcibly impose a lie. This is the part of the story where the protagonist is faced with a consequential choice, in which the protagonist attempts to forcibly impose the lie. In refusing to relinquish their truth, the protagonist passes through a door of no return, in which they are forced to leave the normal world of the first act and enter the adventure world of the main conflict in the second act. While Hogarth's class is shown a demonstration of a nuclear bomb, Hogarth is occupied sketching the giant, reinforcing that he does not share the mass paranoia of the town. But the point of no return comes when government agent Kent Mansley shows up in Rockwell looking for the giant. Mansley's presence in the town reinforces the idea that the giant is a threat and the mass paranoia that already exists is amplified. Because Kent Mansley and the government are actively pursuing the giant, Hogarth now chooses to actively hide him. Hogarth now has left his normal world and passed the point of no return. Point 4. Uncertain if truth is capable of defeating lie. This is the first point in the second act of the story, where the protagonist has an internal conflict and struggles to use the truth against the strength of the lie. The character experiences doubt about whether the truth is capable of defeating the lie and, as a result, doubts if their personal truth is the actual lie. Point 5. Character proves the power of truth. This part of the story coincides with the midpoint of traditional three-act structure. The protagonist perseveres in following the truth and offers a moment of truth to the world around them. This is the first time the protagonist will demonstrably exhibit the full power and purity of their truth. At least one significant supporting character will be impacted positively or negatively by this revelation. Hogarth introduces the giant to Dean, a local artist and junkyard owner. Just like the rest of Rockwell, Dean is skeptical of the giant's motives and considers him a threat but the giant's childlike innocence and friendship with Hogarth quickly wins Dean over. This part of the story also delivers the most powerful moral message to the giant. There is a moment in which Hogarth and the giant come across the body of a dead deer killed by hunters just moments after the pair saw the creature alive. Hogarth explains the nature of mortality and its place in the cycle of life. The giant, who is effectively a child, is rattled by the idea of mortality but Hogarth comforts him with the notion that their souls will live on no matter what happens to their bodies. You have a soul. And souls don't die. The assertion that the giant has a soul is where the Iron Giant shines through as more than a movie about war or weapons. Point 6. Lie-driven characters fight back. In response to the protagonist's powerful demonstration of truth at the midpoint, other lie-driven characters will double down on the lie and use it to mount a formidable counterattack against the protagonist and their truth. 
Kent Mansley gets closer to finding the giant when he's offered a room at the Hughes' house by Hogarth's mother. This is where Hogarth's persistence to protect the giant is tested. But Mansley manages to break the truth from Hogarth and this factual evidence of the giant's existence causes Mansley to alert the government. Point 7. Lie seems to triumph externally. The lie-driven tactics of the antagonist hit the protagonist hard, even to the point of seeming defeat in the external conflict. The protagonist is confronted by a low moment, brought about by the supporting character's continuing refusal to reject the lie. The protagonist must confront the true stakes of what they stand to sacrifice if they continue to embrace the truth. But even in the face of overwhelming odds, they reaffirm their conviction. While under the custody of the American army, Hogarth accidentally activates the defense mechanism in the giant, and its true capability of destruction is revealed for the first time when the giant nearly kills Hogarth unintentionally. Point 8. Final Confrontation Between Truth and Lie The protagonist enters the final confrontation with the antagonist, which decides whether or not they will gain the thing they want. The character consciously and explicitly embraces and wields their truth. Despite a near-death experience and the entire army now hellbent on destroying the giant, Hogarth continues to see its innocence. Hogarth confronts the giant and deactivates its destructive programming with an emotional plea. You don't have to be a gun. You are what you choose to be. Point 9. The truth defeats the lie. This is the climax of the film. The protagonist uses the truth, often with the help of positively changed supporting characters, to defeat the antagonist and gain the thing they want and need. The US government authorizes the use of a nuclear weapon against the giant, with the collateral damage of Rockwell and its residents in the way. But the giant embraces the lessons taught to him by Hogarth and performs the ultimate sacrifice. You stay. I go. The giant gives up his life to destroy the bomb before it kills the people of Rockwell, proving to all of them that he is not a gun. You are who you choose to be. Superman. This moves us on to Wayland's final point in a flat arc. Point 10. The new, truth-empowered normal world. The protagonist enters a new normal world, which is empowered by the truth thanks to their actions. The film concludes with the people of Rockwell ennobling the giant with a statue in his honor. The people of small town America have finally embraced the outsider. What I find so powerful about Hogarth's arc is that it shows the value of teaching people, and that if you persevere with your good morals, then you can have a lasting effect on the people and world around you. 20 years later, the Iron Giant has left a crater in the hearts of the people who grew up watching it. Demanding commentary on identity while transgressing societal expectations, the character stands as a symbol of liberation. Manufactured as a weapon, he instead breaks away from his programming and the expectations set by others and embraces his own moral compass. While it's obvious that one animated film won't single-handedly launch an entire generation into a spiritual, moral, and cultural revolution, shifts in values and worldviews can and do gradually happen with the constantly changing moral zeitgeist. While a 90s film about a robot saving the planet might not be the most recent example, just take a look at some of the best animated films in recent years, and you'll start to realize the weight and complexity of the moral and cultural messages the next generation of children are being enlightened with. No matter how bleak and pessimistic the world might seem right now, it's not difficult to feel a tiny bit positive for the future. We are everything that we choose to be. Superman. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it and want to see more content like this, please consider subscribing as well as supporting us over on Patreon. It really helps support and grow this channel and you can get exclusive access to behind the scenes content, early access to videos, and vote on what video we release next. Stay healthy.